I'm going to cross over. I'd like to welcome my guest to help me look at some of this, what uh, Biden has just said. Out of St. Petersburg, journalist and podcaster uh, Isha Krishnaswamy. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thank you so much for being with us. I, I'm not sure. Did you have the audio? Could you hear um, what Biden was saying? I heard the whole speech. Thank you for having me. And I tried to write down fa factual yeah. errors, but <laughs> I, there were too many to actually write down during the right, speech. Right, I hear speech. you. Yeah. But this seems to be like the usual U.S. bravado of freedom and democracy versus evil, which is almost a comic book framing, which I can't believe anyone in the world still believes this this day and age. Uh, right. It, it's quite interesting, uh, the, the, the staging of it all, the um, uh, basically flags waving and, and talking about freedom. Um, I found it quite interesting. One of the points that, well, a lot of things that he said was uh, interesting to say the least. Uh, but when he talked about it, he's talking to the Russians and he said to the Russian people, just know that um, Western countries, NATO countries, the U.S. have no interest in attacking Russia whatsoever failing to talk about the expansion of NATO up until that point, which uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia has continually said it was because of NATO's expansion that caused all of this. Your take. Well, of course, um, back in 1989, uh, James Baker told uh, Russia, uh, Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO was not going to expand one inch westward past Germany. And now uh, there are NATO countries like Latvia, Lithuania, um, Estonia, which is on the border or with Russia. So they've clearly expanded it. And um, on top of it, I've seen many plans from US think tanks talking about how they are planning to weaken Russia. Like one is a famous one from 2019 by the Rand Corporation. And so it's definitely in the plans. I mean, they also have tried um, color revolution type things, not only with Russia, but neighboring Belarus, which they consider to be a Russian ally. So to say that NATO has no interest in attacking Russia is just 100% of a lie. And then there's also the issue of calling Ukraine a free and sovereign country, which completely ignores what happened in 2014 in Maidan, where uh, President Yanukovych was ousted after protests involving extreme far right, uh, uh, far right groups such as Pravi Sector uh, and uh, uh, Idar Battalion or Azov Battalion, and of course immediately, like the day. Uh, by the way, just so we know, today was also the day where in 2014, when President Yanukovych was forced out of Ukraine. And this was the day where the parliament unilaterally unrolled the constitution from 2010 to the 2004 constitution and appointed an interim president who was not democratically elected. And then they banned a lot of candidates who were, and a lot of candidates were chased out of Ukraine through violence from Pravi sector. So to call, and then with the remaining candidates, um, a candy mogul, uh, Petro Poroshenko won. So. And after that, of course, he nominated a committee of 72 constitutional experts to draft the constitution, including members of the USAID. So to call Ukraine a free and democratic nation is definitely ignoring everything that has happened since 2014. Yeah, definitely uh, quite interesting. And, and you were talking about the various anniversaries uh, on this day. Uh, uh, your overall take, I mean, it just seems as if um, uh, they're just trying to crank it up more. Um, do you get the feel that they're trying to up the ante even more? Um, I'm talking about, of course, uh, NATO and the U.S. Uh, in the name, of course, of Ukraine against Russia right now. I don't know if they're actually upping the ante, but they're definitely speaking the rhetoric of doing that. Um, they are continuing what they have done, which is uh, supply weapons to Ukraine and also military training, which they have since at least 20, 2014 or earlier. But recently, um, it looks like there have been problems with many NATO countries with their supply chains where they can't manufacture, they have having trouble manufacturing their own weapons. So it's been uh, recently a problem. And I wonder if this rhetoric is for uh, President Biden to try to induce other NATO countries who have been reluctant to transfer their weapons to, to Ukraine to 
transfer them, like, or if there's any kind of incentives. So I, I'm not sure if they're actually upping the logistics, but mm -hmm. definitely the rhetoric seems to be uh, much more hawkish. Well, you just talked about the transfer of weapons uh, that's continued now. Um, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin said today uh, about the, uh, the long-range weapons uh, that have been transferred uh, to Ukraine. He says it will only prolong the war and actually make Russia have to um, actually go further into Ukraine to distance themselves as far as the, uh, the distance that the long-range uh, weapons uh, could actually project into Russia. Um, your take on that? Actually, they have already done that. Um, a few months ago, there was um, a place in Russia, Belgogorod, uh, I've been there, where mm -hmm. it was definitely hit by some kind of Ukrainian weapon. So yes, um, the longer that right now the HIMARS, which the Biden administration uh, transferred over like starting from September or actually July, um, has a range of 70 kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, so right now there is a buffer zone of the Dnieper River. And if they were to transfer longer range weapons, of course, um, with the rhetoric of the Ukrainian government and the laws they passed where they've made speaking Russian illegal, where they have systematically discriminated against ethnic Russians, um, it is definitely uh, going to make it so that Russia needs to push the weapons further in order to protect the large number of ethnic Russians in the eastern area of Ukraine uh, known as the Donbass, especially the Donetsk region and the Lugansk region. And then there's also Crimea, which Russia considers to be part of Russia since 2014. And recently, Ukrainian national security chief has been talking about retaking Crimea. And that, again, is going to, of course, um, combined with the rhetoric and the ability of if they happen to transfer the longer range weapons, it will definitely prolong the conflict. and in order for uh, Russia to secure the interests of people they consider their citizens, they will need to move further and further westward in order to demilitarize Ukraine. Well, you're talking about rhetoric. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we see actually the offensives right now uh, by Russia being very effective. Do you think that they have uh, are resorting to increasing the rhetoric um, because of the losses on the battlefield? Or what's your assessment there? Uh, who, uh, by they, are you referring to the Ukrainian side, the U.S. side, or the Russia side? No, I'm talking about the rhetoric by the West, uh, by by NATO, by the Ukrainians that the, you had said um, definitely the rhetoric is there. But on the other hand, we see the Russians actually on the move on the battlefield. So is it because uh, they are sensing their losses, you think, or um, trying to reflect the opposite and saying, uh, being very um, uh, positive, uh, very sure that this war is going to be won by NATO, by the Ukrainians? Is it just this rhetoric that they're trying to pump up the people more and their forces more because there are losses, major losses on the battlefront? Uh, it, there is definitely re rhetoric, but I think it is more because there is dissension within the ranks of the EU and NATO. For example, Hungary refuses to send weapons over to Ukraine. And now in a neighboring Macedonia, which is a neighbor of Ukraine, there are anti, um, there used to be a president who was a very pro-Western president. There's like protests against that. So it's becoming harder and harder for different NATO members to continue to support Ukraine through the same level of financial assistance. And I think this rhetoric is more geared towards them to stop them from faltering than it is either towards the Ukrainian population or the American population. Right. The people just really, they don't seem to matter either way. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being uh, with me out of St. Petersburg, Isha Krishna Swami, journalist and podcaster. Uh, now, viewers, we're going to start our news bulletin this hour.